Greetings and welcome to Match Play TV. Today I want to thank the historic Legacy Golf Resort for this beautiful setting and a wonderful, wonderful day here in Phoenix, Arizona with my guest, baseball great, pitcher, three-time World Series winner, entrepreneur, motivational speaker, author. Who am I talking about? You know, Todd Stottlemyre. Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure, it's an honor, and it's beautiful. It is. I tell you, if it got any better, I don't know what we could do, but we're very grateful and happy to be here with you, Todd, and thank you so much for taking time out of a, what an unbelievable schedule that you have. We're gonna be talking about a lot of things today with Todd, including his transformational mindset and his relentless inner circle. We'll get to that a little bit later. But hey, let's start with growing up as the son and three brothers of Gene and Mel Stottlemyre. You know, yesterday was Mother's Day and I, I have to go to uh, a post that you did um, about your mom, Jean. You said, Happy Mother's Day to our hero. From day one, you have served our needs, loved us unconditionally, supported our dreams, held us accountable to becoming the best version of ourselves, gave us greatness to shoot for, picked us up when we were hurting, have always been our biggest fan, never missed a game while we were growing up, and yes, always kept the umpires in check while yelling at them, we love you, happy Mother's Day. Tell me about Jean Stottlemyre. <clears throat> she's the, uh, you know, she's the rock. She's the glue of the family. And, and, you know, think about it, it's like the only female in our family. Yeah. So she had to be tough. But, uh, you know, she was, you know, when she was growing up, she was an athlete. And, and uh, so she was built for it. And, uh, but, you know, mom was, was always there. And, and when I said held us accountable, absolutely. There was, there was no opportunity to make an excuse in the household. And it was so important because, you know, you, you, you begin to, as you grow up in that environment, then you begin to live that out. And, and not only making excuses, but there's, some, there's an, a re very important word that comes along with that, that's attached to it, that's glove in hand, and that is, that really means that you're going to take 100% responsibility for all of your actions. And well, that's we, how we were held. And that's a whole television show in of itself, and that is taking responsibility when you're an athlete, a sportsman, amateur, or professional, and then on in life as well. And that's a great, that's a great story. Now, Mel Stottlemyre, a great pitcher in his own right, of course, New York Yankees, what a career. And then his career in baseball after being a pitcher he goes on to win five World Series as a coach uh, for some teams, and I, I tell you what, what, was your childhood a Cinderella story? Was it a, a dream childhood? Tell me about that and the influence of your dad. So, I mean, it was pretty crazy. We went to work, first of all, we went, we went to work with dad, and on every home game in New York, um, <laughs> we went to work. And I mean, you think, just think about that concept just for a second is how many kids go to work with their parents. So we were going to work with my father because his work was a pitcher for the New York Yankees and, and having like, Yankee Stadium, Yankee Stadium was a playground. Wow. And, uh, you know, we used to say that the Monument Park was nothing more than our monkey bars. And, 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 and I look back on those times, we wore our Yankee uniform every single day to the stadium. We roamed the dugouts, we roamed the clubhouses, we roamed the field. I stood in center field and during batting practice right, right next to a guy by the name of Mickey Mantle. Wow. And, you know, I think I look back on it now and, of course, you know, as I grew, as obviously as little kids ro roaming around, we, pro we didn't have the appreciation or even understanding of how yeah. big and how powerful it really was. But it was really truly, as a, in my reflection and as I come out of that time, and you look back, it was like going to the School of Champions because yeah. you were around the best of the best. Yeah, I mean, you probably didn't really appreciate like other kids would have been that you were immersed in that, in that world. Tell me about Mel Stottlemyre's mm -hmm. influence on you as you played baseball, you and your brothers, and you continued on through the ranks of baseball. What was his mentoring like? What was his coaching like with you? He went on to be a five-time World Series winner as a coach. So what kind of a coach was he to you boys? Well, everything, and, and it, it starts with trust. It's like when you trust, you know, your mentor, your coach, 
Um, this is where, you know, things can really happen. But, you know, dad was more than father. He was more than dad. He, he, he was dad when he had to be dad. But he was mentor. He was coach. He was our best friend. He was our buddy. I mean, we hung together yeah. uh, in the off season. We hunted and fished together. Uh, we ate dinners together. We played cards together. We were like a little fraternity. Did you, you know, get in so. trouble? And did Dad have to discipline you, or was that Gene's department? No, it was absolutely. It, it was. It depends on how bad the trouble was. Well, what's the worst <laughs> trouble you can remember getting in, and Mel had to step in to. Uh, Take care of business. So I'm almost embarrassed, but uh, you know, we we had this uh, place in Yakima, Washington, and my parents were gone, and 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 my brothers and I decided that we'd loosen our arms up by throwing eggs at cars as they went by, um, and little criminals, right? And and unfortunately, one of the cars that we splattered was a cop car. Boy, what so happened? It was it was time, bad. Time to grab your ankles. It was bad. Yeah, you got spotted. Absolutely. Yeah, you got spotted. man. Absolutely. And my father, remember my father said, you want to throw eggs? Fine, you're going to end up in a life of trouble. But if you're going to throw eggs, you're not, you guys are not throwing baseballs. Ooh. So it was right then, it was like, you, you know. needed to was, decide. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so. Now, growing on up, you went all the way through. At 18 years old, you were offered a contract uh, for, with a major league team in the amateur draft. You turned it down. You turned one down a couple of years later. Um, along the way, though, uh, Todd, I've got to ask you, Mel, of course, went on to become a major league pitcher. We know you did. We're going to get to that in a minute. But you lost a brother along the way from leukemia. Can you tell me about that? You know, probably my biggest setback in life. Um, also, one of the greatest things I've ever done in my life. And, you know, he had leukemia. It started when he was seven. And uh, he battled it into remission. It then came back about two years later um, at nine. Once again, he battled it into remission. And, and then it came back a third time. And when it came back the third time, um, the doctors deemed that his only possibility for a long life uh, was through a bone marrow transplant. So all of the family members got their blood tested and everything else, and, and I came back to perfect match. And, and uh, so I laid down my body. Um, they injected needles, obviously put me out, but they injected needles. Mm. Um, somewhere between 250 and 500 different times into my body, sucking the marrow out, put it in an IV, and then transferred into my little brother's body. And, and I was what 15. What was your age? You were 15. Yeah, he was 11 at the time. I was 15. And, and it was pretty remarkable because after the transplant, you know, a couple weeks had gone by, and Jason was running around the hospital, and, and he was, you know, kind of walking with his IV thing. But you know, the doctors were amazed and, and they were at, actually, they began to talk about um, him leaving the hospital and going on with life and then yeah. and then having a plan to, to check back. And and then two days later, went into a coma, never came out of it, passed away oh. in the middle of the night. And, and uh, you know, as a family, it was because we've always been close as a family, but it was it was it was so difficult. And you can only imagine. My mother and father happened to bury a son and yeah. the trauma. And I know there's people out there in the audience that have gone through that. And, and that's so tragic. And, but, you know, we left that hospital and, and of course, sadness. And, and we were devastated and we were crushed as a family. Mm. But I left with two other emotions that took me more than a decade to get rid of. And that was hate and guilt. And I hated myself. I hated the world. I felt guilty for his death and that my marrow didn't work for his body. And... So in my mind, you know, I left there the murderer of my little brother. You, you was your you fault know? for a yeah. while. Yeah, for Did sure. Did Mel and Gene, your mom and dad, help you cope with that? And how were they coping? Yeah, well, it's difficult. I'll never forget, you know, it was in, in Seattle at, at the Children's Hospital where my little brother passed away. And we lived in Yakima, Washington, across the mountains about two hours. And, and I'll never forget us walking back into that home as a family without my little brother. And, you know, my mom buckled, and you can only imagine, went to her knees. And, yeah. You know, I, I think about it today, you know, the, the, the motion that I have is really, you know, just seeing my mother and, and feeling my mother in, in that incident. But, you know, she went to her knees, and, you know, obvious, you know, as anyone would. And, uh, but I also remember the greatest form of leadership my father ever portrayed, and that was... Um, 
he was going through the same pain we were going through. He was going through the same struggle. Um, and, 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 and yet, in the living room, that day he pulled us all together. And we circled up. And he said that, uh, he said, listen, we're never gonna forget, but together we're gonna lock arms and we're gonna move on. And we're gonna honor um, Jason uh, being in heaven. We're gonna honor it, but we're never gonna forget. And, and to be a father, to be in that kind of pain, to have to pull your family together. Uh, a family that was, you know, just crushed, you know, so. And I know um, over the years, you've raised millions of dollars for Leukemia Foundations. When we come back in just a moment, stay with me please on Match Play TV, Todd is gonna take us through winning back-to-back -back World Series. We'll be back with more Match Play right after these messages. I didn't know how much this shoe could really help my golf swing. So it's like buying a new club. I'm really excited about going out and playing golf now and wearing these and, and having this experience with them. Kind of excited. I want to go back out there. Do you like Tour Edge? I love Tour Edge. This is seriously high tech. And they're long, right, Duff? Built in the USA? Oh, I love that. I need forgiveness. Did I mention these puppies are long? Really long. You know why I love Tour Edge? It's because I win with it. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. The Sights and Sounds of Golf, brought to you by Mother Nature and the members of the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. Mother Nature provides the canvas. We help to make it a work of art. Brought to you by the members of the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America. And now back to Match Play with your host, Ray Adams. Back with Todd Stottlemyre, Major League Baseball pitcher, entrepreneur, author. Todd, thank you so much uh, again for being here today. And thank you so much for that very poignant and intimate um, story about your brother, your family. Um, it, it is a sad story, but you also made it one of encouragement and leadership. And maybe just say one pa final word about that to the audience uh, there. And, and how they can get through maybe that kind of a challenging time. Yeah, so first of all, look, we're all gonna have our own crosses to bear. We're gonna have our own struggles. Like everyone's gonna go through the struggle. Um, none of us are protected from going through the struggle. Um, many of us are gonna go through tragedy and yeah. tragic times. Um, I, 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 and it took a long time for me to really get to a level of understanding. It took me a long time to be able to come out of it, to come out of those emotions because I buried that tragedy inside and it wasn't until I met with Harvey Dorman, Dorfman actually it was after the 93 World Series and and I remember Harvey asked me a question and we spent 12 hours and he's this top sports psychologist worked with lots of Hall of Famers in the baseball world and and I'd met with with, with Harvey and Harvey asked me a question he says would you do it all over again Todd and that was a tough question and I said, yes. I said, I'd do it every single minute yes. of, of every hour yeah. of every day for the rest of my life. So it, you played Major League Baseball under this incredible black cloud of guilt yeah. through two World Series. For sure, yeah. Amazing. That and it was then that he said, if you would do it all over again, he says, then let it go. Oh, let it go. And we cried. 
And it was like, it was time for me to, because I wouldn't have changed anything. Do you think you were grieving finally at that moment yeah, for, for your sure. brother? Yeah, for sure. It took 10 years yeah. to really grieve. It was actually, it was, it was 12, 13 years. And, okay. And then afterwards, we kind of hugged for a minute and he looked at me and he says, if you would have said no, here was my response. Then the response is, then change now and honor the defeat by changing. Ah. And I was like, wow. Honor the defeat by changing. All right, let's talk about the World Series. You went to Canada to play baseball. This is America's pastime, folks. The boys of summer. How do you go to Canada and play baseball? How could you do it? As well as the fact that that's the world uh, center of hockey. Yeah. You go there for baseball, none other. And not only does he go, you win two World Series back to back. Yeah. Did you get a lot of flack for going to Canada and winning World Series and taking it away from U.S. teams? Well, I, <laughs> I wouldn't say I personally got a lot of atta- uh, uh, a lot of flack, but I will say that um, sports radio, sports TV, the last thing they wanted to see was a Canadian team um, win a World Series yeah. because you know it's it was at the time and still is in my belief that's national pastime. Yeah. So how is a team from another country going <laughs> to steal our national pastime? And I always say the team, the 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 uniform. Uh, the name on the front of the jersey is always more important than the name on the back of the jersey. There you go. What a great We lesson. were representing Canada. And I got to tell you, the guys, though, <laughs> we got to a point where it was like because it was it was like the greatest underdog story because everyone else in, in baseball, especially in the United States, the last thing they wanted to do was see us win. All right, so 1992, 1993, back-to-back World Series with the Toronto Blue Jays. And I know that the Phillies mayor at the time, who later became a congressman, Ed Rendell, during the 93 World Series, uh, you were, I don't know how you were pitching, but let's say you had your moments of greatness and you had your moments of mm, Mm not-so-greatness. Well, Ed decided to weigh in and say, I could hit off a Stottlemyre. Well, you won the World Series back to back, and then you had a very, very important message for the then mayor. What was that message? You can kiss my, you know what. You can kiss my, you know what. (laughs) We can't say that on screen. (laughs) And how did that go over? By the way, where did you say that? Yeah, on the on uh, back in Sky Dome (laughs) after the World Series parade, fifty something thousand people in the stadium. And, I, you know, I wasn't smart enough to realize that that was being broadcast live on CNN that day. Did you and Mayor Ed, after you said that, did you have any regrets for saying it? Or did you two come back and have some sort of a peaceful resolution together? Well, the first thing is I didn't have regrets <laughs> because because of that, it led me, after the 93 World Series, it actually led me to Harvey Dorfman. Because I didn't uh, like my response. Okay. Because I didn't like who I was being. I did not. I not only didn't like how I was performing on the field. I didn't like my response or how I was performing off the field. And was I knew that I needed part help. of that down deep inside sure. you, hidden guilt and anger. Yeah, for sure. Because it was a it was a lack of control. Yeah. And then when when Mayor Rendell was like, when he, he took the verbal attack, my only response was to attack and so I knew I knew that my response to life to baseball on the field my response to life off the field needed fix so he he actually helped lead me to Harvey Dorfman yeah all right when we come back we're going to talk a little bit more about that with Mr. Todd Stottlemyre but we're also going to talk about being part of his relentless inner circle We'll be back with more match play right after these messages. Do you like Tour Edge? I love Tour Edge. This is seriously high tech. And they're long, right, Duff? Built in the USA? Oh, I love that. I need forgiveness. Did I mention these puppies are long? Really long. You know why I love Tour Edge? It's because I win with it. Pound for pound, nothing comes close. Here's a great golf solution called Grip Drive. It's simple and easy to use. 
saving you money and keeping your grips in great condition. For chip shots into the green, snap it on your putter to keep that grip dry. Grip drive fits in the back pocket for easy access. Use our powerful magnet to snap onto your golf cart so it's easy to take to the green. Grip Drive provides a convenient ball marker that is always with you. When your grips are dry and in great shape, you'll simply play better. Introducing the Putting Stroke Teacher Training Aid. The Putting Stroke Teacher helps the better player, the PGA Tour player, the, the pro that wants to get out on tour, because the first thing it's going to do is get these forearms lined up square and your shoulders lined up square. And that's the thing my dad and I worked on when I led the tour in putting, and it's the thing I'm constantly checking today to make sure that those are lined up. And that's going to really affect the path that the putter head swings on. Very easy to set up. You just take two pieces, stick them together, put it on the end of your putter, two little Velcro straps, and boom, you're in, and you're ready to go. It's not big. It's very tiny. You can take it apart and stick it in your golf bag. Get the Putting Stroke Teacher and make more putts. Order the Putting Stroke Teacher today. You know, being able to you know, tee it up and look down at your square toes and see exactly uh, where you're lined up. It's not only great on the range, but really nice on the course. Being able to have an extra tool is great on the tee box. With these, the square toed front, not only is it great for my alignment, but I just have a lot of room and I just feel really comfortable. Think of these shoes more as equipment as opposed to apparel. And now back to Match Play with your host, Ray Adams. Welcome back to Match Play with Todd Stottlemyre. Here are the two World Series trophies. These are the replicas from 1992 and 1993. But Todd, you weren't finished yet. You went on to play for the Arizona Diamondbacks and you actually played with them. Now you were injured. Tell us about it in just a moment. You played for the Diamondbacks during the season that they won the World Series. You actually were with them 99 through 2002 and then you finally retired after 15 seasons in the bigs. You retired from our own Arizona Diamondbacks. Tell me about that. Well, I think the the great memory for me was um, 99 was awesome that I got a chance to to be the starting pitcher and winning pitcher of the first playoff game, yeah. the first playoff win for the Arizona Diamondbacks. But and then in 01, you know, I was injured all year, had shoulder issues, had elbow issues, had nerve issues, sat out all year. But I had a, the greatest seat in the house. I had a front row seat to watching that team come together and mm -hmm. to watch them go through all the ups and downs, the struggles, the setbacks, the preparations, mm. the streaks, and to watch them, you know, win that world championship was was incredible. And, and, and I'm glad that in a very small piece, I got to be a part of it, you know, just by being around the clubhouse. Well, you had the best seat in the house. But I had a great seat. All right. Let's get to your career after Major League Baseball because Todd has an unbelievable story. You were very interested in trading and investing and you became a day trader. You became a financial analyst for Merrill Lynch. After you retired from the Diamondbacks, after you retired from Major League Baseball, you then started a hedge fund, which I read that you had said that was one of your dreams also was to have a hedge fund. And then you got hammered like so many people did. Tell me about your financial career for a minute or two and how you handled the defeat of the depre of the recession. So, you know, I went to Merrill Lynch and, and as a financial advisor, I built a team there inside the firm and, and we did extraordinarily well. And we raised lots of money. I had a great team. Um, that team is still intact today. Really? Even though I'm not there. Um, but, you know, after about my fifth year being there, I was like, man, I wanted to do more than go to an office every day. Yeah. And uh, this is when I launched the hedge fund. And yeah. I went from one office to another office. I said, man, I'm not too smart. I didn't want to go to an office. I ended up right back in another office. You know, I was about eight months into the hedge fund and decided this wasn't it. You know, here was a, something that I dreamed of doing, but yet um, I didn't have... I, 
the fulfillment wasn't there, the passion wasn't there, the lifestyle around the career wasn't there like baseball for me. Yeah. Um, so I decided I was gonna, I did a walk away and I was like, I'll just go figure it out. And I'm just gonna go try a bunch of different things. Yeah. And we started building some businesses and we started collecting businesses. And then what I began doing is if we needed to come up for capital to purchase another company, I would take the uh, best best asset and I would go use leverage to go then go buy that. So we were building and, and I was in the middle of building an empire. I remember my wife said to me one time, she goes, <laughs> how much is enough? How much is, when is enough gonna be enough? And the competition. Yeah, and then when the world turned upside down, yeah. of course, the leverage players got just killed first. So you were out, you were done, guy. you were gone, you were over, and I know that you have written one book. You're working on your second book right mm -hmm. now. By the way, what's the working title of the second book? Um, you're going to be the first, I guess. Breaking news right here on Match Play. Are you title ready? of the second book. I haven't announced it, but I'm going to go ahead and do that, all right? We're ready. The Observer. The Observer by Todd Stottlemyre. Yeah. Can you give us just a little hint about what it might be about? Yeah. It's about reflection. It's about awareness. It's about clarity. It's about an understanding. It's about learning. How do we become a member of your relentless inner circle? What is it and how can we be a part of yeah, it? So the best way to find out about it really is just go to my website at ToddOfficial.com. ToddOfficial. Com. And the Relentless Inner Circle is literally once a month, I just go live and with the group. And if you can't catch it live, you can catch it on replay and there's a back office. But I go live and, and I go live through lessons. So here's what I'll tell you is that I haven't stopped growing. I haven't stopped getting better. I haven't stopped pursuing, which means what? That I'm consistently, continually failing my way through this thing. And as I fail, I develop a lesson and it develops a training and then I share with the people inside the Relentless Inner Circle so that it gives them a chance to also get better. Todd Stottlemyre, thank you so much. Many blessings, greatness ahead, more for you and for you right here on Match Play TV. <laughs>place where reality exceeds your dreams where time is not measured in days hours or minutes but in smiles new experiences and new friends a place where happiness is not a feeling it's a way of life here you're not just a visitor your family there are many languages in the world and our smile speaks them all